forensic students. We are continuing on with our lesson over forensic anthropology. This is lesson three in a four-part series. So in lesson one, we talked about forensic anthropology and the role of a forensic anthropologist. And then in the last lesson, lesson two, we talked about the human skull and what sort of clues as far as biological profile and other clues anthropologists can gather to then turn over to investigators when the human skull is found at a crime scene. Today, our focus is on the pelvic bone and specifically how it can be used to determine the sex of an individual. Uh, and then in the last lesson, lesson four, we're going to talk about long bones in the body and how they can be used to determine the height of an individual. All right, now the discovery of skeletal remains is going to prompt prompt immediate questions from investigators. And remember, this is treated as an active crime scene. It doesn't matter if these remains are fresh remains or ancient remains. Investigators are, are going to secure the crime scene. They're going to process the crime scene. Um, they're going to ask questions. So some of the things that they're going to want to know if this is a crime scene that they are working, they're going to want to know, are these remains human? And if so, was this person male or female? What was their biological ancestry? How old was the person at death? How tall was the person? How long has this person been dead? Um, and then what was the most probable cause of death? Now, forensic anthropologists um, are highly specialized in this field. Pathologists, police officers, coroners, crime scene investigators, field investigators, uh, they're not usually properly trained to recover and analyze skeletal remains, so they might call in the assistance of the forensic anthropologist. Um, who's going to be best suited to recover and examine the remains and provide answers to these questions that investigators are going to have? Now, after uh, the remains have been recovered in the field, they're usually transported to a medical examiner's office um, or some other laboratory facility for examination. And for each set of human remains, forensic anthropologists will attempt to provide general physical descriptions or biological profiles, which we talked about in the last lesson. And by biological profile, we mean sex, age at death, ancestry, height. Uh, and then there's some other clues that can be determined as well. So they're also going to try to determine whether the bones provide evidence of cause of death um, and time since death. Uh, so all of those are things that bones can be used to determine, um, but the pelvic bone specifically is used to determine the sex of an individual. Uh, and the human pelvis provides the most reliable means for determining sex. The female pelvic bone is designed to offer optimal space for the birth canal, which is going to be reflected in its morphology or shape um, as compared to the male pelvic bone. Now, anthropologists, although they're going to take measurements to determine gender, they often can just eyeball it. So they can do a gross observation or just a visual inspection to determine if uh, remains, specifically pelvic remains, are male or female. Now, just like we did with the human skull lesson, I ask you to pause the video and just kind of research uh, the anatomy of the human skull before we got into the lesson. I want you to do the same thing today. So if you have this worksheet, if you're in my class, you have this worksheet, I want you to pause the video and just do a Google search to try to um, determine where these different parts are located in the female and male pelvic region. Um, and then what are some specific differences between the female pelvic bone and the male pelvic bone. Uh, if you're not in my class, you can still, you can see um, the different terms that you need to be familiar with before you watch the rest of the video. So pause the video now, do a quick search, and then come back. All right, so you need to make sure this is recorded in your notes. Perhaps you found it in your research. If you did not, um, just make sure that you know these are some differences in the female pelvic bone um, as compared to the male pelvic bone. Now, there are other differences that are not listed here, but these are the ones that I specifically want you to know for this class. All right, so let's start with the subpubic angle. So for female, this is going to be 90 degrees or greater. Um, and again, that just provides optimal space for the birth canal. 
in males, this is going to be an acute angle. It's going to be less than 90 degrees. Then we have the hips, or what we call the ilium. For females, it's going to be more relaxed, wider. The male ilium is going to be more upright and narrow, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. Uh, now, as far as the pelvic cavity, for a female, it's going to be more oval-shaped. It's going to be larger as compared to the male. The male's pelvic cavity is going to be smaller, uh, and it's typically heart-shaped. And then the coccyx is going to be shorter for a female, longer for a male. It's going to curve outward in the female and curve inward in the male. All right, so using this information, I want you to see if you can determine which of these pelvic bones, um, these are replicas, which of these replicas are male and which are female. Now, hopefully you got this right. Um, so let's talk about some, some general characteristics of the male pelvic bone now that we can see a, an image. So overall, the male pelvic bone is going to be more rugged. The ilium, which are the hips, um, are going to be more narrow and upright. The pelvic cavity is going to be smaller as opposed to um, the female pelvic cavity. The subcubic angle is going to be more of an acute angle. And then the coccyx, although it's hard to tell here, is going to be longer in the male pelvis. Now for the pe uh, female, females are often more uh, gracile. Their pelvis is going to be smoother overall. Their ilium is going to be wider, so their hips will be wider. The pelvic cavity is going to be a lot larger in the female. Um, and that's to provide that wide birth canal needed for childbirth. All right, so this is where we're going to stop for today, um, and I will see you in the final forensic anthropology lesson where we're going to be talking about long bones.